Amen. Amen. Take a seat, everyone, just for a moment. And welcome to Flood Church. It's good to be here once again. How is everyone doing? Yeah. Everyone's good? Uh, God is good. Okay, as you know, we've been doing a series on following Jesus. And I'm excited this morning. This is a big topic. It's a wonderful topic. And so I'm going to jump straight into it. Um, <clears throat> following Jesus, I think, is the most wonderful thing a person can do. At the same time, it's probably the most challenging thing we can do. And so today I'm going to be talking about how wonderful it is to follow Jesus and how challenging it is to follow Jesus. On one hand, we gain everything. When we give our life to Jesus, we gain everything. We have eternal life with God. Regardless of the quality of the life that we have on earth, we know that eventually uh, we will be with him, we'll be in his presence forever. So on one hand, we gain everything, right? On the other hand, it will cost us everything. We're required to lay down our lives, follow in obedience, trust him completely. And it's a life of sacrifice and a life of eternal gain. So for the last time, and I promise you can relax after this, let's stand for God's word. We're just going to stand for one minute. <clears throat> Thank you so much. And the passage today is Mark chapter 1 verse 16 to 20 as he was going along by the sea of galilee he saw simon and andrew the brother of simon casting a net in the sea for they were fishermen and jesus said to them follow me and i will make you become fishers of men immediately they left their nets and followed him going on a little further he saw james the son of zebedee and john his brother who were also in a boat mending nets. Immediately he called them and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and they went away to follow him. Amen. Amen. You can take your seat everyone and relax. Not enough to fall asleep, but just you can chill for the next 25 minutes. Okay, so as usual, I'll give a quick bit of context to this passage that we just read, just so we all understand where we're up to. Just prior to this, Jesus had been baptised by John, and we get this beautiful picture, the Father speaking from heaven, the Holy Spirit coming down like a dove, and Jesus the Son. We have the, the Trinity all in this one spot of Jesus being baptised, verse 11. Verse 13 Jesus then goes on to be tempted in the desert. Then John gets arrested, so Jesus goes to Galilee. And he's preaching this message. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. That's verse 15. And then verse 16, the next verse is what we just uh, read. So Jesus is walking along the Sea of Galilee. He's preaching this message about the kingdom of God is at hand and repent and believe in this good news that Jesus is bringing. So, I think it's really important uh, that we narrow in on just a couple of words for one moment. First of all, one of the incredible things about the Bible is it's living. It's living and active, as the Word of God says. It speaks to us as we read it. The Holy Spirit speaks to us and reveals things when we open it up, this is the, the living word of God. There's no book in the world that is like this. The Quran isn't like this. The, the Hindu book isn't like this. No great novel, although it may speak some uh, good things to you. It's not living in the sense where the word of God is, where we can open it up and the Holy Spirit can reveal things to us and speak to us. However, the New Testament and the time of this story, it's about 2,000 years ago we're talking about. A bit more, 2,010 years ago, something like that. So we're not living in this part of the world. We're not familiar with the Jewish culture. So there's a, a really important aspect that I want to 
focus on just for a moment. I think it's going to be uh, valuable to us this morning as we're talking about following Jesus. Jesus says, follow me. This phrase uh, that Jesus uses when he calls his disciples uh, is very much related to us following Jesus today. And so Pastor Dali just say he wants to meet up with me or Tumpale and he's talking to Tumpale. He says, you know, I see you have great potential. I won't put on the accent. I see you have great potential. Um, I see you're, you're a good husband. And I've been thinking about this for a long time and I've decided I want you to follow me. Tumpale would be like, where? Where to? We're going to uh, Chapiku Plus. Where, we, where do you want me to follow you to? He, it wouldn't be familiar to him. Okay? Because culturally we, we don't use this term and this is not how we uh, operate in discipleship. However, the rabbis today, the Jewish rabbis and at the time of Jesus, uh, would look for people who had potential and just say, me, if I'm a Jewish rabbi, I'd be looking for someone that I want to make my students, my Talmudim. And so I'm looking for people. I don't have any students right now, but I would say this guy, this guy, this guy, and maybe this guy. They all have potential. I can see that they're hungry to learn about the, the Tanakh, the Old Testament. And so I would tell them to follow me. What that means is, he needs to leave his job. He needs to leave his family for periods of time. And he needs to become my student. Okay, so when Jesus is walking along the Sea of Galilee and he says, follow me. He doesn't mean like to just keep walking with me a little bit further down the, the seashore. What he means is, um, he's inviting them to enter a personal relationship with him. He's inviting people into his inner circle that other people may know about Jesus or they may know about the rabbi or they might pass him, but they're not eating with him in his house. They're not walking with him day after day. And so Jesus is inviting them as a rabbi. He's inviting them into his inner circle to have relationship with him, to learn from him and to be a close part of his community. And not only would the rabbi teach uh, from the Tanakh, the Old Testament, they would also teach them their own interpretation. What does it mean according to this rabbi? So Jesus, when he says, follow me, he's saying, be my student, be in my inner circle, uh, stop whatever life you're doing. The fishermen stopped fishing to become disciples and learn about how he teaches the law, how he applies the law. You become a student of the law or of the Old Testament. And so just like Jesus is calling his disciples at this time, follow me. He's also calling us today to follow him. So what does that mean for us? We're going to talk about that in a moment. And the difference with Jesus, which is interesting, is I might want to pick Tumpale because I know he's got potential. I know he's a man of God. I know he's a husband to one wife. I know he's in the word. He's an easy pick. If you want a, a, a gathering of good students, because he's, he's a good guy. But Jesus, he didn't go immediately for the good guys, for the ones with the potential. He, he picked a fisherman, fisherman. He picked a tax collector. He, had a, he was the guy who had the group of people that were like the rough guys, where all the other rabbis, they wanted to walk around looking uh, holy, looking like they have these students who are so... Uh, in love with the law and who are walking upright, who are righteous. Jesus had this group of people they were not seen as righteous. They were the, the people from the other part of society that were not popular. And I think that's important for us because in spite of how good or how bad our life is, how much we're following Jesus' commandments or not, he still chooses us. In spite of our background, our family history, whatever has happened in our past life, he still chooses us to follow him, just like he chose these guys. So, what does Jesus expect of his followers? Jesus calls his followers to keep his commandments because these commandments lead to life, 
freedom, joy, peace, and much more. Jesus, Jesus's, Jesus's commandments and the commandments of God are wonderful. They're beautiful and they're perfect. And I had this massive revelation a few years ago when I read this passage. I'm going way off my way ahead of myself here about God's law. And sometimes we think of it as, ah, oh, that's, you know, the Old Testament. It's full of these harsh things that are not good for us. And they're not really relevant to us anymore. And thank God we're in this new covenant. Um, but Jesus didn't think like that. And he thought the law was perfect. He thought the law was beautiful. He thought the law uh, was wonderful. And so what does Jesus expect of his followers? When he calls us to follow him, like he's calling us to follow him, uh, what does he expect? I'm just going to go through quickly a few verses. Uh, so Matthew 16, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? So the last verse there, he's pretty much saying, uh, <clears throat> if just say I say no to Jesus and I pursue all the things of the world and then at the end of the, my life I have all these things that I've gained, material, worldly things, but I've forfeited my, my soul and my eternal destiny with God. And Jesus is saying, what's, what's the point of doing that? Next verse, Matthew 10. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Eesh, this is a tough verse. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. So Jesus puts this high emphasis on following him that, of course, love your mother and father. Of course, love your sons, your daughters. Of course, love your family. But we don't want to put them in a place where they are at the top of our life and we are completely 100% devoted to them, serving them when we're supposed to be called to follow Jesus. So he's saying, first of all, if I'm not number one in your life, then something else is number one in your life. And it might not be your mother and father or your sons and your daughters. It's, I know we've made, this has been a joke before, but let's talk football. Football can be above God in your life. And you would never say that if God was standing, Jesus was standing here and Chelsea Football Club was standing here. I hope no, no, this is going to go well. And, and Jesus is like, who are you going to choose? Of course, please, that we would all choose Jesus, right? That, that would be obvious. But for some reason, because he's not literally standing right there next to us, uh, oftentimes... Something as trivial, sorry to say it, as football can become something above God in our life. Your girlfriend, boyfriend could become something above God in your life. So Jesus' expectation is on his followers, watch football, no problem. Go out with your girlfriend, boyfriend, husband, wife, no problem, your kids. But at the top, the number one thing you're to, to be devoted to is Jesus. Okay? So this is the expectation he has. So <clears throat> uh, one of the foundations of, I'll say the Judo-Christian faith, the Jewish Christian faith, is obedience to the law, whether it's the Old Testament or New Testament. Many of us have an issue with keeping the law, like I was saying. It's like it's religious or it's rigid. Even the word, the law, and I'm saying it a bit dramatic, but... <laughs> Does that give you feelings of joy and bliss and peace? And oh, I just want to get into that law and be following it strictly, even strictly. Oh, I don't like strict. But th this is, this is a, a false way to, to view the law, I think. And so a few years ago, I've been wrestling with this about uh, the Old Testament. And you read many uh, parts of the law and there's some tough things in there. But listen to this, the psalmist in the book of Psalms 119. 
I mean, the first verse is all we need. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. So he's talking, obviously, before the New Testament, he's talking about the Old Testament law. Your commandments make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever mine. <clears throat> I have more insight than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the aged, more than the old people, because I have observed your precepts. I have restrained my feet from every evil way that I may keep your word. I have not turned aside from your ordinances, for you yourself have taught me. How sweet are your words to my taste. Yes, sweeter than honey to my mouth. For your precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. Isn't that beautiful? Um, illustration of how this man sees the law of God. It's, it's beautiful. It's, and, and of course, when we get to Jesus, he frees us from having to fulfill the law to be saved. Now, no longer do we have to complete all the tasks that God put before the people to make yourself righteous. We don't have to do that anymore. Now we have Jesus. And so following him and laying down our life to him, it's not about keeping the law anymore, although the law is beautiful, but it didn't free the people. It didn't free them from their sins. They still always went back, no matter how hard they tried, always went back to sinning somehow. And now Jesus comes along to free us from the law. So I just came up with this quote. Following Jesus is to love him and his commandments, for they are life to our very soul. And Jesus says, if you love me, do you know what it is? Keep my commandments. If we love him, we keep his commandments. So we've talked about some of the expectations of following Jesus, that we need to put him first in our life, that there's a sacrificial aspect to following Jesus. We can't say that we follow him and not obey his commandments. Or we can't say we, we're a follower of Jesus and not do the things that he said to do. So there is expectations in following Jesus. Although following him and keeping his commandments is beautiful, freeing, it's wonderful, it's where we get life. So some of the promises we get uh, for following Jesus. He says in Matthew 11, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So coming to Jesus and following him is not burdensome. It's actually freeing. And keeping his commandments it frees us from going astray and following the ways of the world. We have to follow something. We have to be obedient to something. Either we're following the world and the ways of the world or we're following something else. And so Jesus, he lays out this perfect way to live. Just follow me. Just follow my commandments. They're beautiful. They're wonderful. John 8 Verse 12, then Jesus again spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So if we follow Jesus, we're not going to be in darkness. We're not going to be wondering what we're supposed to be doing or led astray by evil in this world. John 15, I'm just going to move fast through these. John 15, if you abide in me, and my words abide in you. Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified in this, that you bear much fruit, and so to prove, and so prove to be my disciples. Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. So he's saying, if Jesus' words abide in us, if we have his words in us, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you and that he loves us. The God who created the universe, who created everything by the 
words of his mouth, loves us, the followers of Jesus. Matthew 19. And even and everyone who has left houses or brothers and sisters or father and mother or children or farms for my name's sake will receive many times as much and will inherit eternal life. And I think about this with our own life as being people who have followed God to different places around the earth and we leave behind beautiful families. We have relatives who have passed away. We have relatives who have got married and you just aren't able to be there because we're following God and following what he said. And even if he didn't give us anything for that, he's still infinitely worth following. But he promises, those of you, if you sacrifice something important to follow him, don't think that he's not going to repay you for it. He says, his promises is, I'll repay you. I'll repay you now and I'll repay you in heaven. And so if we have to sacrifice something for Jesus, know this, he's promised you that he'll always repay you for it. And in John 3, 16, <clears throat> I find this verse, uh, we always talk about just the first part of it, but I want to read uh, also the last part as it relates to us as well. We all know John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God, so whoever believes in him shall not perish. That's, let's not brush over that too fast. That's a pretty big uh, promise that he's giving us. The tragedy of this world is people are perishing. They're perishing because they've rejected God and they've rejected his ways, his commandments. And so there are people who are perishing, but God says, if you believe in him, you will be one of the people who will not be perishing. <laughs> You'll be with him forever. You will have eternal life. That is a huge promise. And that alone should be something that would, should bring us much joy. For God did not send his son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son. And this is the judgment, that the light that he promised us before has come into the world and men loved the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for lest his deeds be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been done by God. So Jesus gives us these promises as being followers. Yes, there are things we need to do. If you're a true follower of Jesus, a true follower of the rabbi, the Messiah, there are things we need to do. There are commandments we need to keep. There are also huge, incredible, wonderful promises that he gives us as his followers. So don't think, oh, I, I, I want to do this, but I really feel that it's going to be you know, going against something that Jesus said, so I'm not going to do it. Don't think that God is not going to reward you for that. His promises are, anyone who gives up these things, and he names some of them, you'll be rewarded now, and you'll be rewarded in eternal life as well. So just to wrap up today, guys, uh, Jesus promises when we follow him, this is what he does for us, unconditional love, forgiveness, relationship with God, his spirit. Remember, he said he's going to the Father and he's going to send the Holy Spirit and he'll be with you and he'll be in you. So he sends us his Holy Spirit that will be in us and his Spirit guides us in this life and speaks to us. So we get his Spirit. We get joy. We get peace when we follow him. We are adopted as sons and daughters of God. He adopts us as his children. 
We get eternal life with him. We'll be with him forever. And the Bible says when he's coming again on the clouds of heaven and he's coming to rule and reign on this earth forever, it says he calls up all those who have died in the faith. He calls them up. All those who are still alive at that time when he returns again, he calls them up and we come down with him to rule and reign on earth forever. We have eternal life with Jesus because we choose to follow him and we choose to keep his commandments. We're able to stand blameless before God. Even if you sin, John says uh, in 1 John, that I give you these things that you may not sin, but if you do sin, you have the advocate and he forgives you. So we can stand blameless as followers of Jesus. We can stand blameless before God in the age to come. We can worship and praise him in all his glory forever. This is our reward for following Jesus. And then Jesus, he leaves us with this final call. Okay, you've said yes to follow me. You've said yes, you're going to lay down some things. There's going to be a cost, but you've said yes to that. Like Jesus gives that story about the man who... Uh, oh man, I'm going to butcher this because it just came off the top of my head. The man, he's going to build something. But first, he needs to make all the, the costs... Oh, I'm going to need this much uh, tin. I'm going to need this many bricks. Do I have enough to actually build this thing? If I do, yes, then I'm all in. I'm going to build it. It's the same with following Jesus. There's a cost and we look at it and we're like, but we don't think, do I have enough tin? We think, am I going to give him everything? Am I going to lay down everything to follow him? my own dreams, my own hopes in my life? Am I going to lay it all down? And when we do, this is the, the, the paradox of God. When we say yes and we lay it down, it's not like all of a sudden we start losing all these things. God actually blesses us. When we say yes and lay down our life before him, when we count the cost, and we say yes to following him, no matter what. He blesses us. So he leaves us finally with this charge. What do we do now as followers of God? We keep his commandments. Uh, we honor him with our lips. We worship him. And this final thing he says in Matthew 28, he says, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. Now, who is he talking to here? He's talking to his disciples. And so in the context of the passage, he's talking to his disciples. But then when we say, okay, how does this speak to me? Some people would say, ah, oh, this is just for the evangelist. Or oh, this is just for the missionary. They're supposed to go and make disciples of all nations. He's talking to all his disciples. And this is for all of us. We're all called to go and make disciples. You don't need to be an evangelist. You don't need to be a missionary. You don't need to be a preacher. But we go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Who's supposed to do the baptizing in Malawi? Is it the, is it the reverend? Is it the prophet, apostle? Is it the evangelist? Anyone, I would say. Hopefully I'm not. Anyone. You baptize someone. If you find, oh, they've never been baptized and they want to be a follower of Jesus, we just baptize them. We don't have time to fly in the prophet, apostle. Just baptize. We're all followers of Jesus. We're all called to this great commission. Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. This I'm going to make a case for is for all of us. This is the great commission that we can all fulfill and we can all fulfill it in our lifetime. If we have this heart that I want to follow Jesus and I want to go and make his name known to everyone that I know. I want to go and bring the gospel, whether it's in my university. I'll even go as far as to say 
in your workplace, regardless of what workplace you work in, there's always going to be an opportunity, a time that will come up that you're able to share your faith with someone and able to share the gospel. And if we have this heart, obedience to Jesus, to his commandments, and obedience to fulfilling the Great Commission, then we will see the nations come to God. We'll see cities come to God. We'll see our neighborhoods come to God. And so this is uh, what God is calling us to do as his people. Don't feel like you don't have a place in fulfilling the Great Commission. Don't think that oh, I don't know the Bible that well, or I'm too young, or any, there's no excuse. You're called. Everyone here is called. It's just a matter of who is saying, yes, Lord, send me. Amen. And I just want to encourage us all before we go today. That is Jesus worth it? Is he worth everything? Is he worth laying down our lives for? I would say from, from me, infinitely, 1,000%, wholeheartedly, yes, he's worth it. If we love him, obey his commandments. His commandments are in his word. We can all read it. The Holy Spirit can reveal truths to us when we read this for ourselves that's the beauty and splendor of god's word is it's for everyone into every language to every tribe to every person on earth we're trying to get this word of god and that anyone if you can read he will speak to you if we love him obey his commandments his commandments are in his word his word will guide us. His spirit will lead us into all truth. And as he promised, he will be with us now and forever. So let's say yes to Jesus in following him. Amen.